Our, our final speaker for the session is Jonathan Fitzgerald. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you for uh, letting me speak at this exciting session. And uh, in, in general, I've really liked this meeting. You know, getting this chance to see different organisms and different people in different lines of work coming together has sort of reinvigorated my passion for seed biology, because I study seeds. Um, because I figure if half of the molecular people that I've been listening to cure half of the diseases that they're talking about, that we're going to have a lot of mouths to feed. And of course, seeds, no matter what your diet, are going to be central to that. And if we want to reduce that carbon footprint, again, seeds are going to be important. And, you know, the general spiel for seed biology is that, you know, breeders for centuries have noticed that there's this positive correlation between the size of the seed and uh, plant vigor, right? Um, but when people try to optimize maybe something like oil content for biofuels um, or, or nutritive value um, outside of GMOs, um, that there tends to be these then trade-offs. Um, and, and what would be nice is if you could actually separate that and really understand what are the mechanisms, what is involved in just generating larger seeds, seed size. Um, and that's what I work on. Um, but that's a complicated question for several reasons. It's an interesting genetic puzzle because if you look back at early development, the seed itself is basically um, constructed from three different compartments with three different genetic backgrounds. So we have the, oh, there's my cursor. We have, you know, the maternal support tissues, which are going to be derived from the mother. We're going to have a double fertilization event. So we have the egg cell being fertilized um, at fertilization, and that's going to give rise to a one maternal to one paternal diploid structure, which is going to be the embryo proper. But then a second fertilization event gives rise to the triploid endosperm. And then these things have to coordinate then their development, grow, fill that space, um, and, and provide nutrients for the, the, for the embryo. And if you think about well, what of these structures then maybe predominantly leads to the, the production of seed size or, or dictate seed size, um, what you see again in early development is this proliferation of the cells of the endosperm. And I'm just going to take us briefly through this. So the endosperm is a syncytial form of development, so very like Drosophila, uh, early embryonic development. Um, you get these uh, nuclei, so you know, that's nuclei are going to be free of cytokinesis, so we don't really develop cell walls. But you get this sort of anterior-posterior patterning. And I'm going to show you that a little bit better in the next slide. Then you get cellularization, and once cellularization occurs, then there's the switch from more endosperm proliferation to then embryonic development filling up that space. Um, and to see the sort of domain structure of this, what I want to imagine is that our eyeballs are out here and we're going to look in this direction at that endosperm and we're going to optically remove the maternal um, structures. And this is what we're left with. So here's the maternal structures around the outside. This is in confocal microscope, so we've um, optically sort of removed that. And what each of these are, these little like uh, blotchy things with the holes in the center, is a nucleocytoplasmic domain. So that's going to be a nucleus here in the peripheral endosperm. And then here we have a multinucleic cyst that's thought to be the conduit for maternal resources. And I'm going to remove the, the outlines then, hopefully. No, outlines are supposed to be removed. Okay, well, anyway, here, let's go back here. What I want you to look at is in that peripheral endosperm, so it, within the yellow, you get that synchronous division. So this is, even though this is a syncytium, free nuclei, you get this sort of mitotic domain, and you can see it split right, boom, there. So all of those cells are undergoing this sort of synchronous mitosis. But now, I want you to look down in this region, where those cells now, at the bottom, towards the posterior, are actually immune to that whatever signal. They're not doing that synchronous mitosis, but instead, look at what they do. They start to come together, they start to fuse, and then they start, so you see that fusion event happening right there in the green, and then they migrate down to make this chalazal cyst, right? And this domain structure, 
Um, and sort of the cell memory that's involved there is, is regulated very similarly to what we would find in our cells, in Drosophila, in animals, because if I get rid of polycomb, which is a histomethyltransferase, what we see instead is that all of these nucleocytoplasmic domains, independent of their location, start to form these ectopic cysts. Okay, so we lose the cellularization, we lose the domain structure, um, we mess this thing up. Okay, so, so we have this sort of histomethyltransferase that's involved in maintaining this domain structure, the endosperm. Endosperm is important for the seed size, but then we have these interactions with these three compartments. Another, oh, now it disappears. Another reason that seed size is difficult is because the endosperm, again, is subjected to a type of, of gene regulation called parental genomic imprinting, whereby the expression of a gene depends more on the parent, which provides the gene, as opposed to the gene itself. And, and this is also regulated by polycomb. And just an example, what I'm showing you is expression of one of my favorite genes. It's an Arabidopsis foreman. It's expressed in the posterior pole, and without it, we lose some of that formation of the multinucleic cyst. And what I've done is I've taken the promoter, hooked it up to H2BRFP so that we can see nuclei that are expressing this gene essentially. And what you see is, you know, again, here is this domain structure. This gene is being expressed only in the, in the posterior pole in that chalazal cyst. And if you notice the cross, the cut four is the particular promoter I'm using, it's coming maternally. There's none of this marker from the father, but we see beautiful expression. If I switch that, if I do the reciprocal cross, now the mother's wild type, the father is bringing in the reporter, we don't see any expression at all. So that's that parental genomic imprinting. The expression is dependent on the parent that gives the gene and not the presence of the gene itself. And again, this is regulated by the histomethyltransferase polycomb because if that mother is polycomb defective, which I've done here with the FIS2 mutation, and now the father is carrying that reporter. Not only do I get bright expression in the posterior pole, but again, we've lost that domain specificity. And now we get in the polycomb mutant mother expression of this gene throughout the endosperm. Okay? So complicated genetic regulation. Um, but we can ask, you know, is there a link between parental genomic imprinting and seed size, which is, again, the basis of uh, the, 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 the brux of my talk? And that's been shown in multiple ways. So Rod Scott's group was one of the first to show this with antisense lines. This is a figure from Bob Fisher's group um, using a uh, point mutant. Yes, I think it was a point mutant. We've shown this with heterozygous knockout alleles. The idea is if I've lost DNA methyltransferase ability, I can't methylate DNA, I can't establish an imprint on a gene, okay? So now I'm gonna take those mutants and if I cross them as a father, the resulting seeds are very, very small. If I take that same mutation and cross it as a mother, now the seeds are very, very big. Okay, so the idea here is that mothers are imprinting a specific subset of genes to reduce seed size, maybe to balance resources. And if we go along with you know, the parental conflict hypothesis, which is stemmed from kinship theory, which grows out of some experiments like these. The father is being more aggressive. He is potentially imprinting the genes that would otherwise make the seeds smaller. So it's more of a directed attack of trying to, for my particular offspring, get more of those maternal resources. And that's why in the absence of the ability to imprint, Instead of this father having a normal type seed, now they've become much smaller. So imprinting has this sort of direct effect on resource allocation and the sizes of the seed. So this gets me more to my story. And you can knock out polycom, you can knock out methyltransferases. These mutants are going to have very strong phenotypes. What I'm more interested in is similar half things that happen with natural variants. So if, you know, nature's done a huge number of experiments, and if you start to take different lines from different parts of the world who have adapted to different, you know, situations and start crossing them, you can see very similar effects to this loss of imprinting. So in this case, here is Columbia 
uh, it's a Columbia isolate, it's, it's an ascension from that, C24 and Landsberg. So these are three different ecotypes, lab ascensions that we work with. And what happens if I use, and what I'm showing you is the seed size, it's basically cross-sectional area of, of images of the seeds. If I cross Landsberg or Columbia onto C24, you can see that same sort of increase in growth that you would see if, if there was a loss of, of imprinting. But in the yellow circles, what you see is that reciprocal. So normally you do the cross, you see this increase, you're thinking maybe something like heterosis, but this is showing a definite parent of origin effect. But what's interesting about it is that if you look then at the crosses between Columbia and Landsberg, or Col Columbia on Landsberg and Landsberg on Columbia, it would suggest that whatever Columbia and Landsberg are doing might not be the same thing. Because if Columbia is doing something to C24, Landsberg is doing something to C24, and it was the same mechanism, the same pathway, they shouldn't have that same response to each other. If it was an additive effect, where now we have strong mothers versus strong fathers, then the Columbia and Landsberg should be equally strong mothers as well. What this suggests is that maybe these lines are showing very independent mechanisms for, for maybe the, the targets that they're imprinting or these parental effects that they're having, that it's not as simple as one mechanism. So to look at this, I'm turning to recombinant inbred lines. And I'm using them as experimental populations. There's the advantage that we can map alleles, but then I can also use them experimentally to directly test hypotheses. So are the parental effects of these two lines the result of independently adapted genetic pathways? In other words, I should be able to then genetically dissect them. And if they're separate pathways, then I should be able to add them together and maybe get potentially larger seeds. And I can also test if this parental bias is linked to parental genomic imprinting. Then using a different set of lines, which I'll talk about in a second, um, we can start to look at the maternal side of this. How is the mother responding to that? So this is what we've done. We've taken the columbia landsberg recombinant inbred lines. We've crossed them as fathers onto the C24 mother. And here's the C24 cross to itself. What you can see is that many of the lines have basically lost that ability so, you know, we're segregating Columbia and Landsberg genes now, um, or we have different combinations of them. Some of them have lost that ability to increase the seed size. Majority of them are right around that center, but there's variation within them. But you also see that we've got increased seed size as if we've doubled those pathways. So these numbers would suggest that there might be about three alleles there then that are differing between the Columbia and Landsberg, but there's different pathways that you could actually add together to increase the seed sizes. Um, what we can also do is in these crosses, in a separate set of crosses, dissect them and look at the expression of this maternally expressed gene and see how the different recombinant inbred lines affect that expression. Um, and together then we map these and what we found were two very strong QTLs where Landsberg alleles were able to increase the seed size plus decrease that ATFH5 expression. So the father having an effect on this expression of this maternally expressed gene correlated with seed size. Now we've started mapping these, and I can tell you from F2 mapping data that we've confirmed this QTL, we've confirmed a seed size QTL here, but interestingly we found something else happening on chromosome 4 that suggests that there might be actual differences in targeting. And what that was, was so here we have that marker I showed you before, and we've introduced it in Columbia. It shows the same sort of expression that we've seen. And now I cross that to Landsberg. And then in the F3, we're looking at homozygous lines that are carrying, you know, homozygous reporter. And what you see is lines that have completely suppressed that expression, lines that show normal expression. But now in wild type backgrounds where we're segregating genes from Columbia and Landsberg, you can see that we've regained, we phenotyped that polycomb mutant. Is that my time left? Yeah, okay. Um, so in other words, by mixing around what's, what's happening there, we're actually retargeting genes in a wild type condition where we have polycomb and methyltransferases that should be active. And what I'm going to tell you is that we've now started mapping this and we've got this down to, to a fairly decent interval of, of 500 genes. Um, so because of time, I'm going to skip this portion of it and go to the model. 
Okay. And, and so here's the idea. So let's say that we're the clasal cyst. Let's say we're peripheral endosperm and I'm a paternal gene or a maternal gene. Then polycomb is basically directing which of those are getting expressed in which component. But it seems that the Columbian layer parents can directly influence the expression of that allowed gene and potentially have developed different ways of targeting in their own backgrounds to establish control and regulation of the endosperm. And the other thing that we've demonstrated is that these lines, although in normal crosses appear to be doing similar things, that they're genetically dissectable and actually we can add components from Columbia and Landsberg together to get these huge increases in seed size. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's, that's the end of the session. And uh, just one, one more reminder that, uh, to come back at 10 o'clock for another exciting session. And at 10.45, we'll talk about the future of the meeting. But maybe you can join me in thanking a group of outstanding speakers this morning.